Greg, thank you so much for being here. It's really, really a pleasure to, to have you here. It's good to be here. So you're one of the co-founders and presidents of OpenAI. Um, can you tell us a little bit about why you started OpenAI and what OpenAI is working on? Yeah, in 2015, we had this dinner uh, down in, uh, in, in Palo Alto, uh, not, not too far from here, I guess, uh, with, with a bunch of, of people, like uh, some, some of my co-founders. And uh, we had this question of, is it too late to start a lab trying to build artificial general intelligence? You know, it felt like AI is clearly going somewhere. Maybe you can even get to the point someday that you can build a machine that's as, as smart as, as a human. And it's clear it's just going to change everything. And, you know, it was a question of, do you think that people in this room could, could start a company to, to try to, to make it go well, or maybe it's just kind of already in the hands of, uh, of, of the players that are out there. And I think we all kind of looked at each other and said, it's not obviously impossible. <laughs> maybe it could be done. Uh, and so the next day, I was full time trying to put together a team and, and make it happen. Nice. And so that's, that's, that's our mission. You know, our goal really is to try to make artificial intelligence advance uh, in a way that's most beneficial to yeah. humanity. We have, a, we have a, you know, a research company that we've been actually pushing forward this technology and deploying it to lots of users. That's incredible. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, so you're one of the leads for the large model training at OpenAI, right? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about what's special about large models? Why large models? Yeah, I think that large models are one of the most surprising things in terms of what they can do over the past you know, five years. I, in some ways, it's not too surprising if you fast, if you rewind to the beginning of, of this whole deep learning wave and you know back to the, the 60s and the 50s when people are first starting to think about uh, building building neural nets. It's always been about bigger computers and, and bigger bigger networks. Um, but the thing that's been really magical is that if you take a neural net and you train it on huge amounts of data with huge amounts of diversity, right? So you basically imagine training a model on all the text data on the internet, then it can actually learn to generate text that is almost indistinguishable from human written text and to use it for tasks that, you know, any sort of, you know, language-based task that, that your company might have. And so what we've kind of seen is that if you, rather than train on one narrow data set, uh, you said train on this, this very wide thing, you end up with a model that's more capable towards any of those individual tasks than if you just done the narrow thing. Yeah. And can you give us a sense, I mean, what are the kinds of tasks or results that have impressed you the most? Yeah, so there's kind of two classes of model right now that, that we've deployed and other people have, have uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, r related models as well. Um, there's kind of the GPT family where you pre-train on text. So you literally just say, here's some text, predict the next word, and then you're able to do any sort of classification text or, uh, uh, you know, that the joke writing is starting to work. Uh, oh, and, you know, that uh, actually my, uh, uh, at, at a wedding I was at recently that half the speeches were co-written together with our GPT oh. models. <laughs> That's, I don't suppose you remember any jokes off the top of your head. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's some good ones about how many OpenAI engineers it takes to change a light bulb. <laughs> nice. I, was, I mean, and uh, do you want to tell us also about Dolly or something? Yeah, other? exactly. I think the second class that, that people are starting to see that's really taking, I think, uh, a lot of the internet by storm is text to image generation. And the thing that's so interesting to me is that at the end of the day, we're just sort of having almost the same neural network architecture. You know, there's some differences in, you know, one's using diffusion, one's using an autoregressive objective, but like, it really is just that you just show it a bunch of bits and you say, please, could you output a bunch of bits? Like, this is just a bunch of examples of humans doing it and now do the same thing yourself. And that that task of being able to predict what comes next is something that we've been able to, to make succeed. So now you can ask for a, you know, a dog playing chess on the moon and you'll get a picture of a dog playing chess on the moon and it will sort of get all the context right of having like, you know, partly the shadows and that if it's a dog on the moon probably needs a spacesuit, um, and all these sort of concepts that we always sort of were like, well, how are you supposed to get that inside of a neural net? It's all sort of emerging from just being able to have all this, this experience baked into the model. Yeah, and for people who haven't seen these images, they are, they are incredibly good. I mean, th this stuff is, people have been working on image generation and, and language, you know, language models for a long time, but the difference is just how good they are now. Yep, we, we have an Instagram, uh, you should check it out. <laughs> and uh, it's pretty fun, there's just all sorts of variety in there. Yeah. So on the infrastructure topic, You've built a lot of infrastructure, a lot of distributed systems, uh, both at OpenAI as well as at Stripe. Is that right? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about um, you know, how infrastructure at OpenAI started out and how it's evolved over time? Yep. 
So I always gravitated to infrastructure because you get this leverage out of building at this lower level, right? Like, you know, if you're the person who supports everything, you kind of can claim credit, you know, for, for, for all these great things that people do on top of you. And so at, at OpenAI, you know, when we started out, uh, we built, you know, we sort of looked around at the open source ecosystem uh, rather than having to sort of reinvent all the wheels that, that we had, had to do at Stripe. And, you know, there were things like Kubernetes and Terraform and kind of all of these, these projects that just made it so that we could just move faster. We didn't have to build like a bunch of management for the server infrastructure and, you know, obviously you're building on top of a cloud and, and all, all, of that, all of that stuff. Um, so there's a question of, okay, so at the actual application scheduling layer, what do you do? And that we kind of first, we had a bunch of projects that were kind of like handwritten, you know, you have a Redis and you like, you know, write your own little protocol for moving things back and forth. And then, you know, we sort of rediscovered MPI, which is a you know, piece of technology and protocol that's existed for, for decades now and is used in a lot of HPC stuff. And so MPI for a long time really became the way that we would do uh, sort of the, you have some processes and you want to coordinate uh, amongst them. You want to launch them all and you want them to talk to each other. And, uh, I, you know, I think that we really, at one point, ended up with a system where we had kind of MPI for some core stuff, but then you really find you want to flexibly talk to your model. You want to be able to make requests to it. You want to be able to say, okay, I want to, you know, sort of run some inference on this pass, but I also want to do some training on that pass, and then I want to, like, hook up the result from this model to that model for doing some sort of reinforcement learning. And so we built a, another layer on top of the MPI stuff uh, that, that we called Rook, where you, uh, you basically just had a pickle TCP stream. And then you start doing things like, okay, well, I want to broadcast this request to all of the, the workers, and so we're gonna use MPI to like, you know, one worker will receive it, and then we MPI to everyone, and like, you can just see there's just a lot of complexity that was home built, and all of these features that just like, we never added, like being able to make multiple requests at once, like we had no story for that. Yeah, and I mean, this must have been a lot of work, building all of this. Is that, can you say something about the level of investment or effort or maintenance? It was the bare minimum <laughs> amount of investment we could make and still not be unhappy. And so it was definitely a decent amount of work. And it's one of those things where it's like, if something's not your core competence, if yeah. you really just want to be training the models, you're thinking about why am I like shuffling around the bits and dealing with yeah. like a TCP stream with pickles in it and stuff. I just want to like send this request from this model to that one. And I want to be able to just, I just want it to happen. Yeah. And presumably you didn't, you didn't start OpenAI because you wanted to be in the business of maintaining and managing infrastructure. Yeah, that's not, <laughs> not, not necessarily a burning passion. Right, right. Um, so can you tell us about what led you to Ray, and what, um, what brought you there? Yeah, so we were doing a big rewrite of, of all of our infrastructure and really trying to kind of just go through all the details, get, get those right, and really see just like, are there better ways to architect? Uh, and when it came to this sort of the system I described of, okay, you know, we can, we can write all this application logic, but we just want to wire together processes and have them launch and kind of know if they've broken, and like be able to, to be very flexible and be able to, uh, you know, get back exceptions and, and all, all of those sort of things that sound like table stakes. Um, and kind of did a, a survey of, the, of, of what's out there. And, uh, you know, we, we looked at Dask, we looked at Ray, we looked at probably like, you know, half dozen other projects. And Ray was, was uh, by far the, the winner. Mm -hmm. And can you say a little bit about how that's played out and what are you using Ray for today or what the impact has had? Yeah, so we're using it to train our largest models. Um, so it's, it's been very, very helpful for us in terms of just being able to scale up to, uh, uh, to pretty unprecedented scale and to not, not go crazy. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's actually been, uh, uh, you know, one thing that I think has been really important. There's both the infrastructure side, but I think also just honestly working with the Ray team has been yeah. really great. Um, and that there's just a lot of, of, uh, of sort of like, you know, we keep, every time you push the bound, every time you scale up by 10x, every time you just do something new, you're always going to be in some weird territory. And I think that, yeah, we found that, uh, uh, that just like that Ray yeah. out of the box provides quite, quite a lot of what we need. And for people who don't know, OpenAI is really at the frontier of training large models and scaling machine learning and, you know, is, is pushing the limits of just what anyone has, has done out there. So it's, it's incredible, it's incredible stuff. Um, can you say a little bit about what you like about Ray or the, or the things that, um, you, know, you know, previously you were using MPI, what do you see as the delta there? Yeah, I think, I think the big thing is, you know, we weren't just using MPI, right? We were using like MPI with this like hybrid on top of it. And then our alternative was to just like kind of again do this like Redis thing where you're like, okay, like now when something goes wrong, I gotta add this additional feature. And so I think the thing I really appreciate about Ray is that it really owns a whole layer um, and not in an opaque, opaque way either. 
right? So it's like you really get all of the RPC stuff for free and kind of all the details around being able to sort of be like, well, I want to be making multiple requests to this actor and um, that something went wrong here and I want to be able to breakpoint there and, uh, you know, even little things like being able to just put a breakpoint in any actor was just like not something we'd ever built in our old stack and, and now, now we have it. And so I think that there's just a lot of this developer friendliness and the fact that it is a third-party tool that we don't have to maintain. Uh, when yeah. something goes wrong, we can complain on, on yeah. GitHub <laughs> rather than have to, uh, to get an engineer to go, yeah. go work on it. So reducing some of the, you know, the burden of building and maintaining infrastructure, yep. and you mentioned some of the uh, um, you know, helping with developer productivity. Is that yeah. yeah, I think it's been, it's been very impactful. And it's, you know, I, I mentioned large model training is where it really started, but we've seen it start to kind of like you know, spiral out into, into other applications. Like, you know, you want to process some data and you want to like schedule across a lot of machines. It's actually very convenient to, uh, to just run that on top of Ray and, and not have to think very hard. And how, you mentioned you know, developer velocity. Like, how important is that to you? Extremely. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Nice. Um, <laughs> I think, yeah, we agree. <laughs> same thing for us. Um, are there other thoughts you'd like to share about just the future of AI or where AI is headed? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that it's really, again, just like AI has been this surprising field. Like, if you, if you rewind, like, I do a lot of studying of kind of the whatever, whatever documents you can find from the 60s or the 90s. Um, and you really see that there's always been this great debate between, let's say, the neural net people and the symbolic systems people, which were literally pretty different people, right? It was just like different camps. And that the, the, the symbolic systems people were like these neural net people, they have no idea what they're doing. All they want to do is just like build a bigger computer. Like all they can think about is just like add more layers. And like, <laughs> you know, like you, you look at, at today and I think that you'll see the exact same kinds of criticisms. Um, but the thing that I think is so remarkable is that despite all this like very focused sort of naysaying and all these reasons that it's, it's aesthetically displeasing to have these systems built in the way that, that they work of like you have some floats that are moving around inside of some thing. Like, I would rather just have like a very clear symbol that's like written out here and I can just like see it. Um, which by the way, it's not really how your brain works, I guess. <laughs> so we should probably complain about that too. Um, but I think that, that the fact that it's really been working so well for so long and the fact that we're now moving beyond the game playing to now we have the GPTs of the world, the dollies of the world that are actually useful, right? We've actually reached that baseline where it's like, we build a model, we expose it in our API, people want to use it and can build businesses on top of it and can use it their daily lives. Like that to me is just remarkable. And so I think that the, the momentum here, like the progress, it's not stopping, not anytime soon. I mean, maybe it will at some point. Um, but I think that there's just like so much juice left to squeeze and partly we need to build better models and partly we need to get them just into sort of lots of different companies and, and lots of different yeah. people's hands. You mentioned people building businesses and products and applications you know, using this on top of the stuff you're building. Are there any applications or businesses or products you've seen emerge on, on top of these models that uh, you find particularly exciting? Yeah, I mean, I think there's just a lot of applications you would never think of. Um, and you know, there's, there's ones that are like pouring over documents to find pot potential tax deductions for you. <laughs> uh, there's ones that provide real accessibility to people who, who wouldn't otherwise, for example, uh, someone who, uh, who summarizes complicated notices for tenants who don't have access to legal aid. Um, and uh, that there's, you know, sort of, I think, a lot of different applications. I think, like, with, with Dolly, some of my favorites are seeing 3D, like, physical world artists who actually built sculptures and stuff. And before, you know, they'd, like, sketch something out. But now they can just say what they want and get something that looks pretty, pretty close to it. And, uh, you know, people using it for uh, planning out, like, wedding <laughs> venues and stuff where, again, you just have this vision, you want to communicate it to someone. Like, you actually get the picture is worth a thousand words without having to be someone who's very good at the mechanics of, of drawing, which, you know, I don't know about you, but I was never very good at. <laughs> no, I'm in the same boat. Um, I mean, a lot of these applications you're talking about are things that would have been written off as potentially too difficult or, you know, we don't know how to do them not that long ago. Right? Yeah. I mean, and presumably, this is just the start. I think it's just the start. I'd say that... Like, if there's one thing that OpenAI does concretely, you know, just in terms of our research activities, I think it's every year we really aim to achieve something that was previously impossible. And we've been good doing goal. it. It's a good goal. <laughs> it's, you know, if you just do that repeatedly, yeah. <laughs> successfully, then you've got to end up somewhere good at some point. And, I just uh, want to make sure I heard that properly. You said every year achieve something that was previously impossible. Yes. Yep. And, and I think, you know, you look at where 
the history was, you know, there was, a, there was a period where it was really in the game playing realm. So we did this video game called Dota 2. And, you know, the first year we, we beat the best players at the kind of restricted version, just one versus one. But the real game is like a 5v5, almost more like basketball than, you know, heads up. And, uh, and there we beat like pretty good players a year later. And then, you know, half a year, a year later, we beat the best players in the world. And, you know, it's a great accomplishment. Like, I'm really proud of the team. Like, I spent a lot of, of you know, time burning, burning the oil on that project. But it's so much more exciting now to be like, yeah, like people are actually able to use the GPT models. People are able to use the Dolly models. That it actually affects their lives. And it's something that people really want to, you know, use and, and see get, get better. Yeah, that's, uh, that's incredible. Um, anything else on your mind or anything you'd like to share about uh, perhaps anything OpenAI is working on that you're excited about now or that you can, that you can share or, um, or anything else you know, that we should have touched on? Yeah. Um, well, I, I really think that, that the kind of future of how people are going to build AI models is, is really sort of still an open question in some ways, but I just kind of think it's going to be more of everything, like all the activities we see where it's like, you know, I think that, I mean, it's kind of funny. I feel like for maybe, maybe, maybe the transition to, to, to internet slash web was like a little bit before our time, but we all have a sense of, of kind of what it was like, where it's just like, you know, everyone's like, there's this web buzzword, and like, I'm just like, you know, I'm like Macy's or something, I gotta figure out what my web strategy <laughs> is, and like, you know, like, does it really matter, does it not? And that it ended up being something I think was actually a fairly like slow transition to really get things to, to end up online. And I kind of feel like, you know, that the first, you know, called the, the, tech, the tech boom bust uh, was like a little bit too early, and it was really, you needed mobile, you needed to have like all this, like a cell phone in everyone's pocket, you needed to have like this great connectivity before it was really important for every business to have an answer for, for being online. I kind of think that for AI, it's going to go faster. I think that you're already starting to see it, like we see it, that so many of our customers are just big traditional companies that you would never expect would be like at the cutting edge of innovation. But I think people just kind of get it. They see the value. Everyone has tons of, of you know, data within their company that they just can't use, can't do anything with, and has seen how much previous disruptions have made a difference for their business. And so I kind of think that we're going to see lots of companies training models, um, hopefully many of them <laughs> using, using Ray. Uh, I would, I would, I would uh, say that we have had great success with it. Uh, and I think that there will also be lots of people who are building on top of mm -hmm. the, kinds of the, the kinds of APIs that we provide. So that we basically provide this like super powerful model that can do things that just you would not be able to train your own to do. And then you can use it for your specific application. And so I think we should kind of expect you know, these like you know, we've kind of been in a world where you can talk to your phone, kind of, in a very stilted way, right? It's got reasonable voice in, voice out, as long as it's not too noisy and that you kind of, you know, sort of contort yourself to the device. Um, but I think we're going to end up it moving the other direction, where the device will really contort itself to you, and it'll really understand you and under, know things about, you know, whatever, whatever history you, you've, you've, you've had together um, and help you accomplish whatever you, you, want, you want to do. That would be incredible. And yeah. I, I hope you're right that it happens uh, as quickly as possible. Yeah, well, uh, the, more, the more that we can all train our, our models cool. on top of good infrastructure. Thank you so much, Greg. This is really a pleasure. And everyone, please join me in thanking Greg Brockman. Thank you. Thank you.